Hiya. John McDonnell, welcome to everybody. We've got a huge number of people who have joined us this evening and I just want to welcome everyone and say thanks for coming along. Uh, we've, we've got a whole range of speakers to talk about um, the campaign we're waging now to ensure that Paul Holmes is elected as General Secretary as Unison. This is a absolutely huge opportunity for us on the left within the union itself and for, well, I suppose for our members, for our rank and file members about making sure that they're properly represented and that we have an effective General Secretary and someone with a, well, I think a really long track record of just being a good trade unionist, a good representative, working class representative in the way I suppose that many of us have always wanted a trade union leader to be. Paul Holmes is not the sort of person, most of you know him, he's not the sort of person who puts himself forward unless he's putting himself forward to do a job. And when he does a job, he does it, always, always does it well with 100% commitment. Um, he's going to be embarrassed at me saying these things, he doesn't like praise, but I tell you, I've known him over the years He's the sort of poor trade genius. Well, he's the sort of trade genius I've always respected. The sort of trade union representative, and yeah, let's be honest, a trade union leader. But I think is embodies what the trade union movement is all about in terms of selfless dedication, commitment, and toughness. Really, when it comes to fighting for principle, standing firm on those principles, but also Paul has demonstrated over the years what it means to be a trade union rep. In other words, you talk to your members, you listen to your members, you make sure that where there are well, where there are disagreements, you bring people together and you hammer it out and then you negotiate on the, the behalf. And in negotiations, you stand firm. You're constructive, of course you are, because you want to get a result. But when necessary, you stand firm and you mobilize the strength of your members. And our strength comes from our collective power when we come together. That's why, you know, I always say about the history of our movement, it started when people discovered a secret. And it was way back at the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, which was in the fields and in the small workshops and the factories that were emerging then. That secret was, was well, it was solidarity. You know, when we put it on our banners, uh, injury to one is an injury to all, unity is strength. And then in in, in uh, South America, in Latin America, you know, the workers united will never be defeated slogan came forward it's in, in Spanish, if you remember, initially. And that's what our movement is all about. And I think that's what Paul is all about, too. And that's why I was pleased to back him last time he, he ran. And I'm so pleased to, I'm so pleased to back him now. I feel last time, I don't want to go through the history of this. I just thought, actually, the opportunity of having a general secretary, a working class general secretary, a proper trade unionist, a real representative, hard worker, a principal person like Paul, was well, was stolen from us in the last election. This time round, we've got to make sure that, well, we do everything we possibly can in terms of organization to get that vote out for Paul. Okay, now, it's, all, it's, it's about representing our members. And what better than to have a a rank and file member representing them. What better than to have someone you know, who's actually in the forefront of the struggles that we've had over the years to try and get decent pay, proper working conditions, and recognition for our union as well. Whenever there's been a battle, you know, and it's the same with the political battles that I've had. Whenever there's been a battle, any of us, when we've wanted solidarity and support, Paul's always been there. Half the time, you never even had to ask him. He was just there. He turned up and he backed us up. Well, that's the sort of that's the sort of trade union leader I want. That's the sort of general secretary I want. And I also think we've got to recognise as a union, like many other organisations, not just trade unions, but others as well, is actually that there's been times when, well, there's been times when the bureaucracy is has overridden the, the wishes of the members themselves, the bureaucracies. Someone who will genuinely represent us. I've been a Unison member since the organisation was formed. Before that, I was a new P member and I was a, 
as a nuclear rep. And we always prided ourselves that we were a members union, that we it was our members who led this union. It was a member led union, a rank and file organized and led union. I think we lost our way somewhere along the line. Now, what we've got is we establish that this has to be, and you know, we know the members will support because they see in him reflected what they go through every day at work in terms of their representations, the need for representation in terms of the struggles, whether it's over pay or conditions or against privatization and outsourcing. They see in Paul someone who's a kindred spirit. They see someone who'll stand alongside them. And that's why I think it's critically important. But we do support him. And this time round, I think the support's there. Um, Paul has been doing hustings meetings. Um, it's interesting. He's winning in those hosting meetings on every occasion, but also he's winning in areas and in well, amongst groups that we've not had that level of support before. And I think that's because people people have had enough. They want a general secretary who'll fight for them. They want they want someone who'll be straight with them. They want someone who'll properly represent them. And Paul comes across that uh, exactly like that to people. You know, what you see with Paul is what you get. He's as straight as a die. There's no side to him. He's as honest as a day is long. And what happens is, is that people see that in him. That's why I think he's gaining the support. I think they've had enough of, I think they've had enough of suits. I think they've had enough of bureaucrats. I think they've had enough of people who will get elected and then fail to back them, fail to support them. They see in Paul someone who will. Some are, some are a principal, some are a vast experience, but above all, they are somewhat of courage and commitment. So I think we all have a responsibility as Unison members. It's a responsibility on our shoulders now to make sure that we organise to ensure Paul is elected and that we confront then the individual issues that people raise with us, that we can demonstrate that by electing Paul, we can tackle those issues and that we can well, we can regain this union for its members. That's what Unison was all about. That's when I was in UP, and that's what it was all about. It's a member-led union, and Paul is the members' candidate. So I'd like to introduce Paul to talk to us about why he's standing, what his program is, and exactly how he sees the future of this union. There are a whole range of other speakers as well, which is really terrific. And they will reflect the breadth of support that Paul has got within this union and the sort of people who actually, you know, there's a, most of the people who are speaking tonight are heroes in their own and heroines in their different ways because they've been to school and they've represented members and they've stood firm. And I think, as I said, they've shown, quite a number of them have shown real courage in, in doing that in some of the most difficult circumstances. And these are the sort of people that are representing Paul and supporting Paul in this campaign. So thanks for everyone for coming along. This meeting is going to last about an hour, the whole, whole series of speakers, but the first speaker is Paul Holmes himself. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the first thing I want to say to everybody is, look, you can't lead when there's nobody to follow. So I'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in this. And the first person, I'm going to quote from a few philosophers in this speech. And the first one is Bill Shankly. Um, Bill Shankly said, if you're going to have a team, it's got to be led by natural enthusiasm. You've got to have that, that's it essential. And I think we've done that. So what we've got now is a situation where I think this, this race is wide open. I've already got 22 nominations at this moment in time, halfway through the campaign. You only need 25 to be on the ballot paper. But I want to start off when I left school, because the last lesson I ever had at school, the general studies teacher said to me that, and he was a Labour councillor in Brighouse, he said to me, he says, these are the things you need to know, Paul, in the next 20 years. By the year 2000, there'll be free electricity because of nuclear power. There'll be free petrol because of North Sea oil. There'll be free uh, uh, gas because of North Sea gas. The, you'll retire at 40, and you'll be working a five-hour week within the next 20 years. Now, I'd like to meet him again 
and talk to him about what happened after the next twenty. But that's not what happened. We arrived at 2008. I certainly in local government have had no reduction in hours since the day that I started. And we arrived at 2008 and the government told us we're now going to go backwards. Everybody thought, certainly since I was a child, that things would go forwards. So I've had my own personal record is I've been 40 years a member and steward. I've been 30 years a national executive member. Uh, sorry, a branch secretary of the eighth biggest branch in Britain. I've been 13 years an NEC member, been elected seven times, got a wide breadth of experience, been in three branches, but we cover local government, we cover universities, I've been in a police, a branch of called police, youth, probation, prosecuting solicitors, etc. So I know the union inside out. And as branch secretary of Kirkley's Union, one of the biggest branches, just got just above 8,000 members. And people in local government will understand what I'm talking about when I say this. We've had one compulsory redundancy in the 30 years I've been the branch secretary. And that's not just about leadership, that's about organisation and coming together. And in that one compulsory redundancy, that was a situation where somebody turned down 26 redeployment jobs and management let everybody know that. But the big change in the union, every branch secretary will tell you that, is how many employers we represent that. When I first became the, the branch secretary in 1989 of Kirkley's Union, we had two employers in the branch. The last time I checked, we've got 203. And that situation has meant that the branches are under ex complete pressure, that the branch secretaries are getting frazzled and fried. You meet branch secretaries who say, I don't want to recruit members in new employers because I can't represent the ones we've got. The expectations are too high. And I think I start off with my main point is the union only consists of the branches and the members. There's nothing else. The union is nothing else but that. The welfare section, the legal section, the regional office, headquarters, everything else is support. The money, the buildings is all support for the branches and the members. So the first key plank of my campaign is 50% of the resources go to the branches and the members. And when I say resources, I just don't mean money because sometimes branches don't want money. They've got money. What they want is expertise. They want professional help. They want buildings, they want advice, they want out uh, staff, et cetera, et cetera. So 50, the whole ethos of the union has got to change. We shut down headquarters, we remain a presence in London. We don't need prestige buildings worth 100 million pounds. We, we need a presence in London because the government's there, the TUC's there, et cetera, et cetera. We move to the Midlands, we move to a green area, that's a debate to be out. But we say to the branches, the resources are yours, what do you want? Because one great general secretary once said to me, Look, Paul, there's two sorts of general secretaries. One that tells you what you can do, and one that tells you what we can. And I've got to tell you, I'm a can-do. It's got to be can-do. Now, every general secretary we've had in this unit, I make no comment on them, but every general secretary we've had, and we've had five general secretary elections while I've been a member, has been an employee of the union. Even though the rules say that the members, you can be general secretary if you're a member, or you're an employee, Everyone's been an employee. And the employees are not point not 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 one percent of the people who can stand. So we've always selected the general secretary from no point no point no point no one percent. And that isn't touching the talent of the union. And what we should be talking about now is how we get people together. The general secretary can't change the union. There's the NEC elections to come next year. There's, there's, there's reinvigorating the membership. And what's happened instead is a gulf has broken up, broken up between the, the full-time officers of the union, many of whom are good employees, but they're consistently told, you, you, you can't do this, branches can't talk to each other, people can't get a fight of each other, you can't support that demonstration, you can't support this demonstration. I was told you couldn't support this NHS demonstration in Leeds that I went to and spoke at on the 8th of August. There comes a point, when, I, when are you a trade union and when are you a business just collecting subscriptions in? And we don't want to be that. The assets of the union are not the buildings. They're not the full-time employees. They're not the money in the bank. The assets of the union are the members' pensions, the members' pay, and the members' terms and conditions. That's how you measure them. And I would throw every penny to defend them because every penny will come back as a pound if you do that. The members need to know and respect the union. And to do that, I stand in the workers' wage. I earn currently £32,000 a year, which is way above the average wage. And I'm happy and content to be that. So the other 105, 106,000 pounds can go back to the union for the lay democracy in the union 
to distribute that to the um, welfare fund and the strike fund. To say to the members, there's two different parts of this union. There's the employees who are on negotiated rates of pay, who it's their job, it's their career, it's what they've chosen to do. But the other part of the union is the elected officials. They're the passion and the leadership and the responsibility of the union. They don't know, need to be on career wages. They need to be on decent wages, average wages, that our members earn. And I call for the election of the Assistant General Secretaries and the Regional Secretaries, because them people are people who are responsible to the membership, not to the hierarchy of the union. And this union's got to be bigger and smaller. It's got to be bigger, it's, it's got to fight its way, it's got to say we're the largest union in Britain, it's got to say we mean business, everybody's got to know who that union is, but it's got to be small because it's got to listen to the members. It's got to listen to what the worries and fears are. When you address a group of members, they only say two things, whether it's 100 home care workers or 100 bin workers. They say, Paul, what you've told, we, we told you what the problem is. What's your plan and what are you going to do? And that's what a leader has to do. And a leader leads from the front. Now, we, in the last 20 years, have never appeared on Question Time. We're the biggest union in Britain. We're at the forefront of the public sector cuts, austerity, and I, I asked question time, why haven't we been on? Why are you keeping us off that program? And they say, you've turned it down. You've turned it down numerous occasions. Well, that can't be the situation. We've got to be on there telling people, like over the last six months, we should have been telling people about PPE, about the 500 plus care and hospital workers that's died during it. At the farce of people being able to pay for professional footballers, and nothing against professional footballers, I could have been with myself. But the situation where footballers are getting tested twice a week and healthcare workers in ICUs and coronavirus units are not getting tested at all unless they're off sick. We should be telling everything. We should be shouting it from the rooftops. We've got to become a shouting union. We've got to say where we are. And the big issue that I've been going on and on and on about for years is democracy. Every decision this union makes, everybody should know how we made it. Everybody should know who made it, and it should be who's made it should be accountable to the members and reporting back to the members. We are we want to be the antithesis of we're reading the papers what this union's done. We should be dictating to the papers what this union's done when the members decide what it's done. Now on NHS pay, who would have thought at the beginning of the year in January that the biggest single issue this year was not going to be Brexit? Everybody thought that would dominate the next 12 months, but it hasn't. It, the spotlight has gone off it on A-level results, NHS pay, coronavirus, et cetera, et cetera, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, because the situation is rapidly changing and it will rapidly change more when the coronavirus goes away because there are cuts coming that's going to make 2008 look like a birthday party. And we've got to organise for those cuts. We can't be saying we give shop discounts or we do this and we don't know that. The members want to know what conditions are they going to be under at work how are they going to be treated with a pension? How are they going to be treated with a pay? And we've seen the music of the future. The music of the future is in Tower Hamlets. The music of the future is in British Gas. It's fire and rehire. You get paid too much, you've got to pay back for this crisis. We don't get paid too much. Big Bill Haywood, the American trade union leader in the miners during the 1920s, says for every person who's got a dollar that they didn't earn, somebody who earned that dollar hasn't got it. And that's what's happening in care homes. That's what's happening all over Britain. The dollar that our members should have got to take their wages up to an average of £15 an hour, which would be my claim. They say we can't recruit in care homes. You pay £15 an hour and find out whether you can recruit or not. But the dollars are all going across the Caribbean. To They're all going there. It's, it's organised and legalised robbery, what's going on. And I've got five pledges that I'm announcing today for this union. And them, them five pledges are really, really clear. The first one is we're going to bring democracy back to this union. We're going to allow the members to understand what's going on. We're going to have a leadership school where nobody's going to check what your politics are to find out whether you're going to be a good steward or whether we need to bring you forward or whether you should be trained. We're going to bring forward the demand for elected people on a worker's wage. We're going to give leadership to this union. We're going to lead off the front foot and we're going to have democracy and we're going to organise this union. This union is not like, it's just like every other union. It, you know, people used to say, 
in the 1890s and, and, and before the First World War into the 1920s. You can't, you can't organize doctors. They're all Irish. They're all immigrant workers. They're unorganizable in a non-trade situation. When I grew up in the 60s and 70s, then workers were the best organized and best paid workers in Britain among the working class. And you inspire people. The coal miners were down to 56, 50, 57 in the wages table in 1972 and 1974. And leaders came in and inspired them to take them back to the top of the league table. And that's what I'm about. I'm about changing this union. And I'm proud to be a member of this union. And I have been a proud record in this union. I think I've got one thing in common with one or two other people who stood for election in the labor movement and won surprisingly over the last four or five years. Because you can look at my record. I haven't set my record from the date the general secretary election opened. I've set my record going back from the day I first became a steward. I were dead lucky, absolutely lucky. I learned my lessons, not out of a book, not a, 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 a trade union school. I learned my lessons from people who knew what they were talking about, people who had organized. And I come to a, a finish on this point now, because I think we need to give other people a chance to speak. But I remember in the miners' strike, in 1984-5, was a very busy year for me. Uh, I was branch secretary of West Yorkshire County Council, which was abolished by the Tories, and 4,000 people were going to lose their jobs by 19, April 1986. The miners' strike was on. I picketed every day in the miners' strike, and I was standing in parliamentary selection in Wakefield, uh, which I narrowly lost that in, in the Labour candidate in the Labour seat in 1985. And I spoke at a meeting in uh, Unity Hall in Wakefield, which is the main speaking hall in Wakefield, and after somebody came in late, a big packed meeting, and somebody came in late. And I, when I went to the pub afterwards and had a chat, and it's, it's really heartbreaking to see people of an adult wage, you know, adults who be used to seeing drinking uptown, trying to sit around a half pint of beer all night because they've been on strike six months. And I said to this lad, Not a bit, you were a bit rude tonight. You, you were late coming to the meeting. Um, uh, you were half an hour late coming in. I said, I'm oh, really sorry, I didn't say that. When he went, this lad said, you ought to be careful, Paul. You ought to be really careful. I says, why? He says, because that lad lives in the woods. He, his dad went back to work. He's lived in the woods for three months. Every day he walks six miles to pick it. He pickets all day long. Then he goes back to the woods and lives there. And his mother sneaks around twice a week without his dad knowing with his clean washing for him in the tent that he lives in in the woods. Now that lad's made a sacrifice. That lad's given his all. And I saw him 10 years later. And his pit had shut. He'd never get to Australia. A coal miner over there. He's happy as Larry. And he said it for the best year of his life. But I've never sacrificed like that. And very trade, few trade union leaders have. And that brings me to the conclusion of what I've got to say. It's not a job being the general secretary of a trade union. It's an absolute honour. 80% of the people in this country have to go to work every day to do something they don't want to do for wages that aren't good enough for doing it. Worried that they might get unemployed because the benefits are rubbish. So it's an absolute honour. It's nearly a holiday to be the General Secretary compared to what most people have to do, get up, work shifts, work out who's covering the kids and stuff like that. So I want to change this union. I want to change it to be the members-led union. I want to be the members candidate to improve a lot of the members on the members' wages and the members' terms and conditions. And as a team, not me, but as a team of people watching this meeting, of people who've inspired by it, nominations are ro rolling in, I know what that, that's what our members want. And when you give people the confidence and the aspiration to do that, they will do it. So let's all get on board this bus and go to where we need to be going. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. That was really terrific. Thanks so, so much. Um, I've got an unstable connection, so I might bleed off and then come back on via my phone. The, um, you know, someone had the idea of having um, full fibre broadband connected to the whole of the country and it being free as part of the nationalised industry. Or whatever happened to that person, anyway, the sort of thing that we need. Our next speaker, thanks Paul for that. Our next speaker is Karen Reisman from, again, she's Unison NEC and she'll talk on health. Most of you will know Karen from the battles that she's waged against victimisation, but also above all else against privatization and in favor of an NHS fully funded with our workers properly paid. Karen. <laughs> thanks very much, John, and thanks very much for agreeing to be part of this campaign and for uh, chairing the meeting tonight. And thanks to Paul for standing, because I do think, I mean, 
John's right. Um, I've been a health worker nearly as long as Paul's been a, uh, uh, a local government worker. And I fought all the way through, but we have never had a harder fight than we have at the moment in order to try and make sure that working class people aren't made to pay for the mess that big business and the government have made of the world that we live in, uh, never mind just, uh, just our country. And I do think that in this election for General Secretary, we are able to ask the question, are you content with the way Unison is? Do you want to carry on with the same sort of people that are running it in the same sort of way that they've been running it? Or do we need to change? And that's why I'm supporting Paul, because I think that we desperately, desperately need for this union to change. I work in the health service um, and I do think that the union is just not designed to make it easy for members to get involved. It's not designed to make it easy for people to get active when they want to fight the injustices that they see at work and in the world, wider world that we live in. You just, I mean, I'm gonna come on to NHS pay because I just think it's a really, really good example. You know, four weeks ago, Rishi Sunak stood up, he announced the pay review bodies for civil service, for judges, for the army, for teachers, and he announced that he was awarding an above inflation uh, award because of the efforts and sacrifices that they'd made. Now, to be honest, it was peanuts that he gave them, and I am not commending the awards that they gave him, but that's what he said. Uh, he was then asked, what about the 900,000 health workers who were, um, who were on Agenda for Change Terms and Conditions? And he said, we've had a really good, they've had a really good three-year deal. This year, they've got 4.4%. They've had 12% over three years. So they don't need a pay rise. And A, that's a lie. We've had 1.67% if you're at the top of your band. But B, that was a three-year deal that was awarded three years ago, pre-COVID, pre the effort and the sacrifice that health workers and social care workers and bin workers and bus workers and lots of other people have made on the front line as, as the COVID virus has shown, who is the really important people in this country and who are the people who are not. MPs were paid £10,000 for working from home and health workers and social care workers have been given not one penny extra for working uh, during uh, during the pandemic. And I just think that when he made that announcement, there were health workers up and down the country that watched it and our jaws dropped, right? And when they stopped dropping, we then got angry, really, really angry. And what's sad is that the union that represents the largest number of health workers in Britain was not there to step in to articulate that anger, was not there to step in to organise that anger, and it was left to spontaneous groups of people some local sort of unison branches but generally spontaneous groups of health workers saying we are not putting up with it and organizing protests and there have been protests in over 50 cities and towns across Britain on not just one occasion but on now a couple of occasions and there's more likely in uh, on the 12th of September and probably in uh, in other areas to come and I just think what is it about unison that when people get attacked and they're angry and they're frustrated. They're so remote from people that they don't get that and they don't organize that fight. Instead, we get instructions about what we're not allowed to do and what we're not allowed to support and what we're not allowed to organize. And we've seen it over PPE, we've seen it over testing, track and tracing. We've seen it over the hundreds of health workers who've died, many whom have died unnecessarily because of the incompetence of our government. And when students can get on the streets and protest and organize themselves and make the government u-turn over an exam fiasco why are we not mobilizing our health workers our social care workers the, the tas who work in them um, in schools a whole number of our members you know could have been out organized and mobilized and this government wouldn't be allowed to kill people in the thousands in the way that it is and we would be able to have much better policies and we desperately desperately need that but you end up in unison where you're looking over your shoulder am i allowed to do this can i say this am i allowed to do that then what can i do and i just think that has to change and part of this campaign is about saying it has to change the government 
government is intent, come what may, on making ordinary people pay. This union has to be fit for purpose. And I know that it needs not just to elect someone like Paul, but it does. But the campaign that we're organising in order to do that is also about trying to rebuild the union, to take seriously the pay revolts, to take seriously the campaigns for safe working, to take seriously the institutional racism that is destroying the lives of, uh, of black and BAME people up and down the, uh, the country. I think that we have some responsibility to do that. And that's why I feel really proud to be part of this campaign, proud of backing Paul, proud of saying that we need to make unison change. And this campaign can be the mechanism by which we really start to do that on the scale we need to do to oppose what the government is doing. And I'd say to anybody who's out there, please get involved. Please nominate Paul if you haven't already in your branch and please encourage people to vote and get involved in the campaign to make sure that we have a union that is fit for purpose, that fights the Tories, that creates justice for all people, whether you're providing public services, using public services or just a member of the public. We need a country that's and, and a world that's going to change. And I think there is a mood out there. You can see it in the health service protest. You can see it in the student protest. You can see it in the Black Lives Matter protests. There are people who want to fight. Our union needs to start organising them better than they are. And I think that starts with the Paul's, with Paul's campaign, as well as all the other things that we're doing without standing on our back. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Really terrific. Really Thank terrific. you very, very much. I'm struggling here with the internet. I'm, do you know, I'm, I'm beginning to think I'm being bugged. Who would do that, I wonder? Thanks, Karen. That's great. Our next speaker is Andrew Tomo Thompson. Andrew's a Kirkleash branch bin worker, and he's been involved in the strike action up there as well. Andrew. Uh, thank you for the invite, and thank you for Paul asking me along to support him. Quite happy to support Paul. I'm quite proud to be. As uh, I'm a steward under Paul in the branch and worked very closely with Paul over the number of years. We've done many strikes within the branch that Paul has been enthusiastic to carry on and push on and encourage the members to vote for it. And when we've lost, when they've lost a ballot, Paul has taken it personally, has taken it hard, but then he's picked himself up to, to fight the next battle and he has done, as he did with the bin workers within Kirklees. I put several um, grievances in in 2017 to do with bullying and harassment, which came to Paul's attention eventually. Paul pulled me in, asked me about it, and Paul decided he wanted to take it further and to fight this cause. He then arranged a meeting with the members, which were very interesting because the members met with Paul and they gave Paul a lot, a lot of grief. But I think it was just more that they had someday to finally air their grievances with. And Paul took it all on the chin and he took everything aboard. But the one thing that come out of the meeting as well was the racism, the eye level of racism, which I think took Paul by a lot of surprise. And I remember Paul saying some of the stuff that was said, he was shocked and surprised. It stuck to things he hadn't heard of in 30 years. But Paul was determined he was going to take it on. We had a long, hard battle, not just with the council but also unfortunately region who didn't want to support us to start with and didn't want to back us but eventually they did much much to Paul Paul fighting the battle and finally we got it he made a lot of promises to the members unfortunately some of them promises got broken but not down to Paul but Paul did everything in his power to try and rectify them and to try and get everything that we wanted in place and we're still now fighting the uh, battle Today, even today, two years on after we had the strike, we had a very big successful ballot with 80% yes vote on a 90% return. I'll say one thing, Paul was very, very confident that we was getting going to get that, more confident than I was. I thought we'd get the yes vote, but I wasn't right sure on what the return would be. But Paul just sat there and says, we'll get it no matter what. And he will prove right at the end of the day. <clears throat> But Paul didn't just stop there once we got the ballot and we won it. He fought and carried on the fight. He carried on taking it to the management. 
and also informing the rest of the branch as well, just so we get support from the branch and from other branches around the country as well. So we had a successful campaign, shut Uddersfield down. Unfortunately, we couldn't shut Jewelsbury down, but Uddersfield was shut and it did shake management to the core. And they came back to us then and they realised they, they had to deal with us and come, come with something for the members, which they eventually did because the members eventually said, we want to go out all out. We're not going to come back until we get it sorted. And I think they just bottled it. They, as Paul used to say, as Paul says, they blink first, they blink before us, which was good. And we thought we had a good strike. Unfortunately, the strike was on the hottest week of the year and it took a lot of toll on us getting up at four o'clock in the morning, being on the picket line till from four till one, twelve, one o'clock. But it was it was a successful strike. A lot of a lot of support from other branches. We had several branches coming down, all thanks to Paul passing the word out. We had several we had the TUC Uddersfield TUC coming down, members of the branch coming down, all all thanks to Paul passing the word around and making sure people knew. So yes. Paul works hard, he will put the work in and he will not let anything go. He's like the dog with a bone, just keeps it going and going and going and will not let it go. So I'd like to say thank you to Paul and support Paul with everything you've got, please. And thank you. Andrew, thanks ever so much. That's terrific. You know, uh, I'm not sure about the dog with a bone, but I think you know, I know what you mean. He certainly is. And that's why... Yeah. Again, that's what I like about him, Andrew. He doesn't give up, never lets go. And, and you need determined people like that. Andrew, thanks ever so much. That was really great. It was, it was from the heart as well, I know. Our next speaker is Kath Owen. She's, Kath, you'll know, she's on the Unison NEC, and she'll be talking about the equalities issues, some of those issues that Karen has already raised as well now. Kath. Thanks very much, John, and um, thank you very much to the campaign for the invite to speak um, at this meeting, which I think is really inspiring. And the campaign so far has been a really inspiring experience. Um, and if you're not already involved, ask what you can do um, to get involved. So equalities, um, to start, there's just some key things I think we, we need to think about when we're, we're talking in this area. And for me, it's the importance of the <coughs> team approach. No one person can represent all the equalities groups. Um, and so any comments about who the candidates are and what their personal characteristics, it doesn't really matter because it's about the team that's behind them because no one person can represent those groups. And I think Paul's made it really clear in his nomination um, manifestos and in what he's already said about his commitment to equalities and the young members of our union. So the reference to the leadership school to bring on all the members, whether they be from different self-organised groups or um, our youth section. And, and there is not enough diversity through all the levels of our union. And that would be a really key um, way of, of bringing people on. And I think also the organising approach will bring us the workplace and the civil rights changes that we need as we build liberation for minority and discriminated groups. So it's not just about lip service and holding unfilled seat committees, it's about change in people's lives. That's what equality means to me. So on race, we have to be led by our black members and people of colour. And white people must also take the responsibility for deconstructing racism. And it's been a really interesting year and really important to, to have those debates coming forward. Paul's committed to um, a racism audit of the union. So that's been inspired by the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement. And this will also help us to address the issues raised by the disgusting Labour leak scandal. Our members are already challenging institutional racism out in our workplace. I know this from my own work in higher education and there are examples from all of the other sectors as well. Much of this is centred around the disproportionate numbers of black workers in lower paid outsourced roles and addressing the race pay gap in our local authorities and universities and then just some institutions. In recruitment, selection, promotion and dis disciplinaries, we see again and again that black and Asian staff are discriminated against as compared to white staff. And that's what the institutional racism means. Our members say we need to put your money where your mouth is in terms of the union taking action on this. We need action on workplace to institutionalise racism and it's deeds, not words. Paul will turn these words into action, taking inspiration from new energy we've had through the Black Lives Matters movement coming to the fore. 
On disabled people's rights, we need to remake the case for a social model of disability and press employers about flexible working, which has proved possible under this lockdown. We also need to defend the rights of those with underlying conditions at risk through this government's neglect. And I think both of those are key issues for our disabled members um, in recent time. On gender and sexuality, we need to support and defend our trans and non-binary siblings and eradicate homophobia and biphobia from all of our workplace and society as a whole. And on women's rights, as a union, we need to start again for part-time and low-paid members where women predominate in those roles. We should be leading a national campaign for decent funded childcare to support parents and staff in the sector. We should be leading a trade union campaign to enshrine domestic violence support in every employer, recognising this as a workplace safety issue, not a private concern. As a, a women's union, we should already be winning on this. We shouldn't be having to make these demands now. These are all workplace issues that our members and branches are currently organising, but we could do so much more with an organising model based on activism, and that is what Paul is calling for. As a Labour Party member, it irritates me that sneering Tories think it's clever to refer to their women leaders as somehow demonstrating better support for women than any male of the Labour Party or any other opposition party. But as a feminist, I can never forgive the harm done to our society by both Thatcher and May. Who the leader is does matter, but their politics have to be sound. It's defeatist to say it's time we had a woman leader if we aren't prepared to make the changes that our women members need. A leader needs to listen, respect others' views, empower others to contribute, make sure it's a team. Posts and the ways putting forward will deliver for all of us. So join us as we do this together. Thanks very much. Kath, thanks ever so much for that. It's just terrific. And it just, you make the point, you know, the point about electing someone like Paul, a leader like Paul, means actually our members will lead. So it will be women, it will be our black members, they'll be taking the lead on these issues. And it will be the team, we will be a team, member-led. And that's the whole point of this. And I'm glad, I'm really glad you made the point, Kath, I really am. Our next speaker is Louisette Batista, and she will be talking about low paid women workers. I remind people there's a number of other speakers and of course I see them on the screen. Our, our good friend and supporter Ken Loach will be speaking towards the end as well. Louisette. Hi everyone. <clears throat> I have many reasons for support for Roms and see a real change in Unison. I am an NEC member for the low paid but most important I am a shop steward. I am a cleaner. I have two jobs. I'm one of the lucky ones because many of my colleagues have to juggle three jobs and family. Every year we hope to be recognized as one of the most important work force. We hope for better conditions, better pay, and every year we are let down by the national pay bargain and Unison headquarters. Every year we do the same hours, but every day we have to work double, particularly now with the pandemic, but still not an increase in our wages. People are afraid to lose their job and now they play the card of you have to be flexible. We, the low paid, are the less protect in health, in safety, we are an invisible class struggling to earn a living. And many have to rely on food banks. Many have to choose between eat or pay their bills. When we see the lack of support, the lack of communication with the low paid, when we are only remembered and used for win elections, but after nothing is done, we get angry. We are very angry in this moment. We want someone to show us they will be in our side when we fight for better pay, for the right to feed our children and to give them a better education. We don't want only words or promise. We want actions. We want them to speak with us, for us. And the only candidate I have seen the passion, the honesty, 
to defending the members was Paul Holmes. Not only words, but with actions. I know when Paul Holmes will be elected, we will receive more fairness, less bureaucracy, with officers being elected by members, branches having more resource they so need, and finally, and more important, workers be heard. Paul is the only candidate who has shown me what respect for the work is. I will support Paul Holmes because I believe he's the only way we will have a unison unite for the members with the members. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was that was terrific. Look, you've asked Lucette, you've asked a really important question about how will Paul approach the issue of low pay, tackling low pay. Paul, do you want to come back in just quickly and answer that question? Because I think it's key to so many of our members. And that's really, we, that's why we need you as General Secretary. Do you just want to respond, Paul, quickly? Well, low pay is a massive issue. You know, how can bankers get a 40 billion, a 40 billion pound bonus last year, which is bigger than the Scottish budget? And take it down to very low level. How can the House of Lords for virtual meetings claim £162 for staying at home when the TV licence, free TV licence for over 75s, many of whom are shielded, mm. uh, are, are being removed? And low pay is about organising and collective bargaining. That's what it's about. And we need to start on low pay by not confusing low pay with low worth. A lot of people do that, particularly those who I think are worth nothing, like hedge fund managers and millionaire bankers. Low pay is often a result of low organisation or lack of representation from the union, lack of organisation. And we need to say, and we found that on, under coronavirus, that people who had low paid jobs in supermarkets, sweeping the streets, bin workers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, haven't got low worth. But some people like to convince us that they've got low esteem. So we have a proper demand, what Lucette has just said, for £15 an hour minimum for all workers on the basis that that's what they're worth. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot for that. It's uh, The reason I brought you in, because I think it's going to be one of the key battles, to be honest, that we're going to have in this coming period, especially if the Tories try and reintroduce austerity as some of the threatening to. Our next speaker is Amin Hardy. She's the chair of Unison's Northwest Black Members Group, and she wants to talk about, well, black workers in unison. I mean, thank please. you, John. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, this is um, both a difficult time and an inspirational time for black workers. It's a difficult time because um, what the coronavirus is exposed is the deep racism that exists within Britain and within the world at the same time about who's disproportionately dying from this virus. And, that, and whatever the Tories may say about not knowing what this is about, this is about institutional racism. This is about a society that puts black workers into the lowest paid positions, that makes them fearful of, of, of demanding PPE and other things that they need to be able to work safely, and disproportionately reprimands them if they start to complain as workers with over-representation and disciplinary grievance. All those things have been exposed by the virus and it puts our members, particularly in the NHS and social care, where many of our black members are, in the front line, not just in terms of trying to save people's life, but trying to save their own lives at the same time. And, you know, one has to, to recognise that this is not going to go away. You know, this is going to be the main issue that confronts us in, in the here and now is about the health and safety of our black workers because they find themselves in a situation in a second, potentially a second wave. That if you looked at the places that are, were victim to it in the first place, the, the, the textile workers in Leicester or places in Blackburn or Oldham or other areas, they find themselves in the areas that are most at risk, um, as well as being the people that are asked to carry on doing their work. Uh, on the buses and other people in other industries, but for us care workers and NH workers are central. And therefore, 
we need to be able to organise those members. There is no shortcut. And that's what's so great about Paul Holmes standing and what he stands for. He stands for organising our members at the rank and file to be able to defend their health and safety, to fight for their pay and their conditions. And many of them are in the private sector and subcontracted services. And we need to be listening to their stories. And when I was shocked to hear some hospital workers talk about the fact the subcontracted firm they work for threatened them if they asked for a risk assessment, they could find themselves without a job. Well, what sort of threat is that from an employer where people are trying to protect themselves in work? It shows you how little they care for human life. And therefore, in, with this government and, and its priorities, we know that this, these battles are going to come our way thick and fast. We need to be fighting over our health and safety. We have to be fighting for our pay. And we need to use the potential that Paul mentioned earlier of the union and their members who want to be organised. I mean, one of the things that's inspired black members to, to raise their demands, and our meetings have been bigger and bigger in the Northwest with black members, is because they want to hear about what they can do to be able to fight and organise themselves, to fight for their fellow workers and for themselves, to protect themselves and fight for their pay and conditions and jobs to come. And we know all those things will be under attack. And I think one of the inspirations the Black Lives Matter movement has given us is to say we shouldn't put up with discrimination anymore. We shouldn't pay up, put up with worse pay or worse jobs. We demand that we fight for equality. And that's what a union leader should be saying. And that's what Paul Holmes will say when he fights for our jobs and services. We'll make sure that we're all together organising and supporting our black workers and our demands. So I think this is a very exciting time for us because I think changes in the air and this is what this campaign represents and we have to be able to organize every section of the union use every potential we got because we're going to need it to win our battles for the future and to fight for that equality that we all deserve so thank you and support paul holmes get organized get involved get in touch with us all and we can make a bigger campaign that can win thanks amin thanks a lot did i call you she i've got i'm trying i tell you what it is I'm, it's because we've We've got large numbers of comrades and brothers and sisters who are campaigning all over the country. And what's been great about our meetings, actually, is that they've not just been gender balanced, there's been the majority of women on most of the platforms, which is great. So I, I'm getting carried away by calling everyone. I, I don't mind, John. I'm okay <laughs> I know. I know. You're a good, you're a good comrade, I mean. Really good of you. And thanks for that. Thanks for that. Thanks for the contribution and the work that you're doing on the ground for us as well. Our next speaker is Ev Doyle from Unison NEC, who wants to talk about branch funding, which Paul has raised already, but all of us in our branches, this has been a key issue about the need to support local branches. Hi, thanks, John. I'm really delighted to be here tonight to support Paul's campaign, but probably a bit less delighted that I've got to try and make branch funding sound like it's something that's exciting, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, I think in terms of, I think the reason why I've been asked to speak is for is for is because for a number of years, my branch, alongside comrades from um, West Sussex and Salford branch, and support from other branches as well, have been working to try through um, at national delegate conference to try and change the um, the formula and try to get a better deal for um, branches. So I think that's why I've been asked to uh, talk about it tonight. So I just want to say a little bit about what the current funding arrangements are within Unison and then a bit about what um, Paul, although he's pinched a bit my uh, story anyway because he's already told us a bit about what he wants to do about it. But in terms of the current um, funding model in Unison, it's actually a brilliant, brilliant um, business model if you want a trade union to run like a business because what it does is it basically gives, um, you know, they take all the subs in and then it gives branches 20% of the, roughly 20% of the money back while well, they keep 80% for nationally and to distribute however they wish. And in actual fact, 90% of the work that is done for members on a day-to-day -day basis is, un is undertaken in those branches with 20% of the union's resources. That's what we do. So all virtually all the representation of members, whether it's um, grievance, disciplinary, um, all those uh, harassment cases, all those sort of things, all the piling on we've had of things like redundancy and reorganizations as a result of um as, of austerity mm. those basically sit with branches and certainly in local government branches the other thing that we do tons of is we are actually responsible for um, a whole host of local terms and conditions that are left for branches to negotiate um, themselves you know themselves so you know i think that um and what so i think in practice 
what do, what we need to look at what that actually delivers because what it delivers is a union leadership who would rather hide in the purple palace than actually um lead any sort of action to fight for to support you know to encourage members to fight for decent pay terms and conditions and all the things we're talking about and it leaves people in branches activists in branches who are willing to fight actually pretty knackered and burnt out quite often um, because of the sheer volume of work that they require that is required um, now i'm really delighted that in terms of this election that all the candidates apparently support more resources for branches who knew because I met myself and other colleagues for quite some time have been trying to battle, the, you know, plug away at this battle about resources. And I can tell you now that neither one of the um, current um, Assistant General Secretary of candidates have ever offered us any support or, or said anything um, that I'm aware of openly about supporting putting additional funding in, in branches. Um, and my view, my personal view about that is there is bigger problem as um, the current General Secretary in any case. Um, but that aside, so Paul. Obviously, is one of those candidates. He's told us tonight. You know, he's saying as well that he wants to do something about funding for branches. So, actually, why do we? Why should we believe that Paul's serious about it? Um, I, I know he's serious about it because I know him personally. He's given given us a lot of support over the years around this issue. But I don't expect you to believe what I have to say. I think what we need to do is look at what he's actually saying in his um, in his manifesto and in his pledges. And he's actually the only candidate who is being very specific about what he's prepared um, to do and what he's prepared to deliver. And believe me, 50 percent of, of the union resources going into branches is a seismic shift in the way in which the union organises. Paul understands that what that does is shifts the power to individual, to, you know, to members and to branches, and that is incredibly important. Um, so I'm really proud that my branch have um, nominated um, Paul for the general secretary election because I believe he is the members candidate, and I believe that what you see, um, what you see, is what you're going to get. Um, and I do, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to speak tonight in support of the campaign um, because I believe that he understands that we need to build um, a union that's based upon actually um, invigorating the branches and supporting um, members to fight. And um, I will leave it at that, really, just to say, please uh, get involved if, you, if you're able to and you've not had a chance to so far. There's still time to nominate um, in your branches and obviously then to turn out the vote for him. Thank you. Thanks, Ev. Uh, thanks ever so much. That's really, really helpful. Uh, Paul, I just want to bring you in for a couple of sentences because Ev, Ev has raised the question that um, Chris Jobson from um, Barnet Branch asked as well, is what will you do to support local branches? Paul, do you want to just say couple of words on that yeah well we've, we've covered the resources but i want to be a general secretary who, when they go to a town or a city goes to the union branch office first that's the place to call in not to see the employer to see the branch that's where you get to know what's going on and saying to the branch you're getting the resources you're getting the money you're what's important to me what are your members saying where should we be going on this and I think it's a complete change of emphasis. I don't think being the general secretary of the union is being ensconced in hundreds of meetings with managers who hate us. You know, I see management as little as possible. I, I want to see the members all the time. I don't want to go and see them, the managers because you need to sort things out with them. But to, re to reinvigorate the branches, you need to tell them how important they are because they're the crux of everything. Evelyn's absolutely right. 90% of the work is done by the branches. That's where the resources should be, but that's where the land should be as well. Thanks, Paul. Spot on. Our next speaker is Glenn, Glenn Williams. He's the local government um, service group executive chair and wants to talk on local government. And again, Paul's had a huge breakthrough this week with regard to the support from the local government services group. Glenn. Thanks very much indeed, John. Uh, I'm going to say it's a real privilege to be introduced by you, John. Uh, it's even more of a privilege to be the warm-up act for such a brilliant uh, filmmaker as Ken Loach. But can I just get this off my chest, Ken? I've spent 15 years having to speak at meetings telling people who I'm not. I'm not Max off EastEnders. And then you go and produce a film called Our Daniel Blake, where everyone thinks I'm Paul, uh, Dave Johns, the actor. So thanks very much for ruining the last 25 years of your life, Ken. You've not heard the last of that. So can I tell people who I am? I am the branch secretary, the elected branch secretary of uh, a local government branch of around about 4,000 members. And I'm really pleased to say that Paul got the unanimous 
uh, nomination from our branch this afternoon. So on behalf of my branch, a, a big congratulations. It was unanimous. And that's a local example, I believe, of what happens when we have leadership that's inclusive, that's accountable, and that's democratic. So I'm happy, really proud to be uh, the branch secretary of that local government branch. I'm also the regional convener for the biggest region uh, in, in, of our 12 regions. And they'll take their decision on the 19th of September. And I hope anybody on this call who's party to that regional council meeting will do everything possible to make sure that we, we deliver a nomination for Paul. As we did in my third hat, really proud to be and proud to be in another elected position as chair of the last the National Local Government Service Group executive, which John alluded to this yesterday, on behalf of 650,000 members, half of the union, against all the odds, this is seismic. They nominated, uh, overwhelmingly nominated uh, Paul to be the, the candidate on behalf. That has never, ever happened before in the history of Unison. And that's one of the principles, I think, um, that's so crucial to this. What Paul has spoken about, which has a resonance with me, and I know it has a resonance with lots of people on this call, is what Paul wants is a power shift, a power grab from the selected to the elected. That's what he wants, and that's one of the main platforms in terms of why I'm supporting Paul Holmes. He wants to see the likes of me, him, and many people on this call being accountable, being transparent, being visible, being democratically elected, because you can bet your bottom dollar, as a result of my branch and the local government service group executive and the decisions they took yesterday, people will be now planning to get me deselected from those positions. I can live with that. I can live with the, the prospect of being deselected because I'm accountable and I'm voted in. And Paul is exactly the same. So that fundamental principle, which has been lost in 25 years within our union, where all the power, resources and influence and decision making is taken by the selected, the invisible, the unaccountable has happened and it's got to stop. So in terms of local government, the first plea, can we please not be conned into this idea that the pandemic has created a crisis in social care? The crisis in social care has been going on longer than Unison has existed. And it's a disgraceful slur on our union that it's been allowed to go on. We've heard from low paid workers and sadly local government has its high, high prevalence of low paid workers. And can I tell you, I think after 30 odd years in local government as an employee and over 30 years as a trade union activist for Nalgo and now Unison, I think I've earned the right to be constructive, constructively critical of my union, of our union. And what a shame sometimes that when that happens and we're inclusive and constructive, you get threatened with disciplinary action. You get threatened with, suspe with suspension because apparently trots and lefties and the ultras can never ever have a good idea. Well, I say what I like about Paul's leadership style and his manifesto is it throws that to the wind. It grasps and grabs good ideas. It's inclusive. It involves everybody. The invisible suits are too exclusive and that has to change. So I don't want the pandemic to be the excuse. We know that local government will be starved of 10 billion pounds. And I don't want that to be the excuse that's used as a smokescreen by local councils, our employers, to starve us all of of, of resources but my union needs to step up to the plate if this was a school report how would you measure the success of our union is it over pay which is crucial well let's look at local government pay we've never ever had a national ballot that's gone over more than 30 percent i don't blame the members for that because what our union what the unelected have, have created is an insurance policy is an invisible organization that supports you only when you get in trouble is it any wonder the last general secretary election turned out less than 10% because there's a disengagement with people. There's a disengagement with members who will only approach us if they want a dental plan or they're in trouble or a holiday or access to Croy Bay. That's not the sort of, those member benefits are crucial, but there has to be a balance. There has to be a notion of joining a collective, joining a strong united voice that has disappeared not in the last two years, but in the last 25 years. And that has to change in local government. We've just had the NJC local government pay rounds. And where you show leadership in branches and regions and where you engage with people for what everybody agreed across the 11 regions was a derisory offer. Where you actually take the arguments on, you win. So in the region where that happened, the region turned around and rejected the 2.75. That leadership happened in some of the branches in the, in, all, in the other regions, but they were outvoted. 
an inertia and disengagement and apathy won. Paul's manifesto is radical. It changes that completely because we will lead on our own pay negotiations. That's what will be different. No more unelected people trying to negotiate my pay. We will have a vested interest in leading in terms of negotiations for our pay. So that school report on pay and how are we doing would not read particularly well. So what else is important to people? Because apparently we might not win on pay, but we'll win on jobs. On jobs in local government, 98% of home care and social care is now privatised. I think it's fairly safe to say we're not doing particularly well on, on uh, securing jobs. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs in local government, right across the piece. I think it's fair to say the school report will say could do better. I'm a final player. I've got no hour. I was only given four hours and 55 minutes to speak, so I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> if we want to judge our union in terms of job security, in terms of pay, in terms of engagement with members on all three crucial fronts, that school report will clearly say we're failing. The way we change is we shift the power. We adopt Paul's manifesto, and if we genuinely, genuinely believe in a lay member union, well, let's be radical and let's elect a lay member to lead a lay member led union. Please support Paul Holmes. It's a radical program for change that will make a difference. Thanks very much indeed, John. Glenn, thanks ever so much for that. That was, that was terrific. And as one of those people who in the past has expressed my concerns about the direction of the union, and then, then you get targeted. You, you get targeted. And it's just, we've got to break that now. We've got to be a union where we can talk to one another, where we can be honest. And that will only come, I think, if Paul is elected as General Secretary and we have this, I think we have this huge breakthrough and it's within our grasp at the moment. And the members, the members themselves, I think, are beginning to wake up to the importance of this election, but we've got so much more to do. Our final speaker, Ken, Glenn has made reference to him. Um, Glenn, I can tell you that I once appeared in a Ken Loach film. I was in that for a about 90 seconds he had me he had me portraying a labor mp would you would you believe it it's interesting though i was expecting an oscar but nothing came and he never invited me back but there again you know i live in hope for the future ken loach isn't just the most brilliant film director that many of us have really ever encountered in terms of the films that we watch i think he's He's got a brilliant technique. It really works to get a message across. But also, he's a fine socialist. He's a great trade unionist. And he stands with us on every struggle whenever we ask him. So it's, to have him supporting Paul, I think, makes us all very, very proud. But it's a reflection of what Paul is all about as well. Ken Loach. Uh, John, uh, that's very kind of you. Um, I, I can't live up to that, I'm afraid. Um, and it's good to see, uh, to, to privileged to listen to such great speakers and good to see Karen again, Karen Reisman. And a message to Glenn. Um, Glenn, if you got a better agent, you could have been in the cast list, you know, so you have to have a word with your Los Angeles agent there, Glenn. And uh, see, you, see you in the next film. Um, we've, in preparing films, we've been, um, I'm going to try and lose my picture off the screen here because it's driving me mad. Um, the, um, in preparing films, we, we've met um, many unison members and uh, hearing their plight again tonight is uh, very salutary. Uh, we met care workers and um, cleaners and NHS workers, of course, and many, um, many are on zero hours contracts, um, insecure work, no holiday pay, no sick pay. And of course, the, many of the care workers not even getting their travel time. So their rate goes way below the minimum wage. Um, and sure, they need a union. And, and, and I want to make two, two points, really. Um, they need a grassroots union. And that's why I'm really pleased to be supporting Paul. Uh, they need a grassroots union that is not dominated by bureaucracies, doesn't put so much energy into the glossy headquarters, um, but it draws its strength from its membership um, and respects them and listens to them and realises that's their strength. Um, 
there used to be an old saying, I don't know if it's still heard, that in a dispute, um, you'd start off fighting the employer, then you fight the union uh, before you fight the police. Um, and that pattern where union leaders would say, well, um, you've shown your strength, now get back to work and let us negotiate. And of course, it was usually a sellout. So a union that actually understands, analyzes the interests of its members and knows the tactics, how to, how to satisfy them and the long-term strategic aims that a union must pursue. That's, that's the union that, that everyone needs um, and unions and members, of course, especially now. Um, and I'm very impressed by Paul's, um, by Paul's proposals because it, they do reflect that the strength of the union is in its membership, in the members' talent, in their determination to resist. Because that's one thing you do learn over many years, people do resist in the end. They resist intolerable circumstances, low pay, insecurity, members have, people have the strength to fight back. And so often the union, their union has not represented this. I remember going back many years, Hillingdon work at the Hillingdon Hospital. I don't know if older, older friends will remember that case too. Um, women, um, many with an Asian background, who fought for the first time in their lives for a year or more and were sold out by Unison, sadly to say, or they felt that was the case. Um, brave, brave women who felt they had nothing from their union. Now that has to change. Well, I hope it has changed to an extent that I'm sure Paul will make certain that something that like, like that never happens again. Res Strength for the, for, the, for, the, for the members through their branches is absolutely essential. The resources, the finance, the personnel, the, the knowledge to fight back. And that's why this, another proposal of education and um, for um, both for leadership and, and tactics, but also in knowing the history of our movement in knowing about the great struggles that have been fought, that all follow the same pattern and we learn so much from knowing about them. Um, and we learn from the successes and we learn from the failures. And it's really important that that, that is part of our, our learning. So many people come into politics. And I was with a, a, a paid organizer for the Labour Party who did not know anything about his Labour Party. Didn't know Ramsay MacDonald, who was he? didn't know uh, about the minor strikes in, the, in 26, knew nothing of the labor history, paid as a labor organizer. We can't have that. We need people who understand, both understand our interests and understand their history and why we are where we are. I think relocating the headquarters is a brilliant idea. Put it in the center of the country. That's where it's most convenient for the members, clearly. Um, put it in the center of the country, great. And what a principal stand to offer to stand on a, on a worker's wage. Um, it absolutely identifies you with the members. You are, there is no them and us then. You are plainly us. So brilliant. And, and every one of those, every one of those uh, proposals seems to me bang on the target. The second point I want to make is we not only need a grassroots union, unions, we need political unions because the problems workers face don't come, they're not acts of God. They're not part of the natural world. They come from an economic system that is based on conflict. And political interests represent the interests of, of one class against another. There's an essential class conflict at the heart of our society. Employers have one set of interests, profit, maximizing market share, cheap labor. Workers have other interests, which is security, a fair wage for, for a fair day's work, health care, pension when you're old. Tony Benn used to, used to recite the list. Their interests are in conflict, fundamental conflict. And so we need, we need a political voice. We need a political voice, not just to speak, but to gain political power. And we came very close to that. And thanks to John and brilliant to see John again and see him frequently and it's always a pleasure. Um, 
we came very close to that. So we need, we need a, a political voice to gain political power. And let's reflect where the Labour Party was. The Labour Party under Blair and Brown proposed privatisation, carried on privatisation, continued the policies that they'd inherited from the Tories, and this privatisation and outsourcing that have led to the gig economy, which have led to insecure work, poverty pay, and all the things that you've been talking about and mentioned at the start. So we need, we need to make that political change to end outsourcing, to end privatisation in the health service, but in the utilities as well. Wherever, wherever key services are outsourced to private companies, the services decrease and the exploitation of the workers increases. So we need, we need political change. So our relationship with the Labour Party is absolutely critical. Um, people have argued for decades and essentially since it was formed, is the Labour Party that vehicle? Well, the struggle is still going on. There's still the many people in the Labour Party, I think maybe still the majority, who stand by that programme. And stand by that programme th that included also included the end of the anti-trade union laws that the Tories had imposed on us to weaken unions, to keep Labour vulnerable, which Blair and Brown had continued to. So ending privatisation, scrapping the anti-union laws, investing in the regions, a green economy. Everyone with a trade union contract from day one of employment. That's fundamental to all trade union struggle. And we have to fight for that. And I think it's interesting, in this um, pandemic, during this uh, extraordinary year, terrible year, have you heard those policies articulated by the new leadership? I've kept my ear close to the ground. I've struggled to hear them. So that's our struggle, is to regain the Labour Party if that is to be our political vehicle. And what encourages me about Paul is that I, I noticed that there was a, a, a letter from many Unison and uh, NEC members saying that the leaked document that showed the treachery at the heart of Labour HQ, treachery to undermine the Labour victory, to attack good people because they were on the left in the most disgusting, misogynistic, racist way. Those people are still there. And Paul and others demanded that the you know, unison, your know, union, should intervene in that. I wonder if the other candidates signed this. I don't know. You will know. But Paul, that's, that's brilliant because that cannot stand. That treachery cannot stand. We have to fight for the democracy in the Labour Party as well as democracies in union and fight for the transformational policies that uh, the Labour Party under Jeremy and John stood for. Anyway, well done. I'm honoured to, to, to say a couple of words. And can I say, if you win, when you win, you'll, you'll, you'll get a lot of attacks. You'll get a lot of abuse. And the strength, I'm sure you have to combat it. But your strength will come from the members who support you. Base yourself on the members and you will be invincible. Anyway, good luck. If you win, we all win. Solidarity, Paul. Karen, that was terrific. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for your support. And you said you couldn't live up to the phrase I was keeping upon you. You already have lived up. As far as we're concerned. Can we... Now, just we're coming to the end of the meeting itself. Um, what I'd like to say to people, if they can still hear me, um, is we need your support now. We're now in the really at, we're at the middle of this campaign, and we need your support. We need your support to be advocating support for Paul, going back to your branches, securing the nominations, and then mobilising that vote. Oh, oh. We'd like you to keep in touch with us. Thanks for coming tonight. It's been a fantastic turnout. It's been absolutely brilliant. So thank you for that. But we need you to keep in touch. Keep 
contact us. You can see there's Twitter, Facebook, all the other mechanisms that are taking place. Please keep in touch and give us that support. Word of mouth. Get out there talking to other Unison members. Emails, Facebook, every form of communication now. We need you to start talking to Unison members and say, look, this is what this is the, what the candidate's standing for. This is Paul Holmes' program. It's about giving power in this union back to you, the members. And, you know, I think, I think we can do this. I think we can have a huge breakthrough in this union. And this could become the union it used to be. You know, when I can remember, I was always proud to be a member of UP. I was proud to be when we formed Unison. Uh, things have gone wrong. It's become bureaucratized. And what we've got to do now is make sure the members take it back. And this becomes a member-led union. And to do that, we need to elect the members' candidate. And that's Paul Holmes. Paul, I don't know if you want to say a few words of thanks to everyone before we close. Yeah, yeah well, I'll say a very brief hey, word, yeah. I once, somebody once said to me, um, look, you don't do hard work, Paul. Why, why do you keep going on about workers? And I said, look, I might not do hard work, but I, I, I represent a lot of people who do, and that's why I want to be a general secretary, representing people who do work on the same terms and conditions that they do. Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody's support. Cheers. Terrific. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thanks for everyone coming tonight. It's been a great rally. It's really set us up for this campaign. Thanks ever so much. Solidarity, brothers and sisters.